This is when, done for Wednesday night, um, for the Wednesday night service. It's dealing again with prophecy, and we're going to cover some of the same material we covered before with some additional uh, aspects to it. Let me just say before we get started that we will start again on the Sunday night services. We'll start this coming Sunday night at 6.30. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to uh, being able to have some fellowship together and having a time that we can kind of enjoy one another. Again, we will be taking temperatures, masks are mandatory. All the good stuff is here. <clears throat> so uh, we will have to remember our social distancing, but <clears throat> once again, uh, I think it's well worth the, uh, the very small risk that we have. Then starting on, on uh, June the 30th, Brother uh, Bruce has announced that he wants to start with upward basketball, and they'll be starting, I believe that to be a Tuesday night, they'll be starting on uh, 6.30 out in the gym. And that'll give the kids some opportunity to do some things that they haven't been able to, to get out and do for a while, so we're looking forward to that. And again, I, I'm kind of, kind of sure that if you ask Bruce, even if you haven't already registered, I kind of think we can work some uh, things in and have some extra kids. We've had, I'm sure the kids are ready to get out of the house. I know that I'm ready to get out of the house, and um, um, my wife's ready for me to get out of the house. So we'll look forward to, to a good time, and we're going to start again as we begin to open things up and uh, begin to come back and worship the Lord. And I don't want to make it sound light, but I think it's so important that we get into and stay in the Word of God. And we're going to cover some things tonight I hope that you find interesting. You can double check them on, online that are current events, and yet uh, um, I think that they're, they're, they're current, they're online, but I think they sure fit in with what we're beginning to see in this world. You know, I, I think that sometimes we have a tendency to, to uh, hear from people who would look at us and say, well, you've been predicting this and saying this all along. But again, let me, let me stipulate that the one thing is different is the nation of Israel is back together again, and that we are in a situation where we're actually seeing the church and Israel working side by side. Uh, I'm not saying that Jews get an automatic entrance into heaven. That's not at all what I'm saying, but I am saying that we see them working together again. We see the nation of Israel here. I think that uh, soon we, we need to see a time and a place that for whatever reason, listen to me very carefully for whatever reason a strong leader will come who will begin to dominate the world I personally think this is not prophetic or anything like that but this is I personally think it will come because of wars and they will come at a time and a place where he will be able to unite the world and with the promise that we will no longer have wars it's going to be a very short-term promise, but I think it will give him the opening that he'll need. We already see this in the pandemic. We already see it uh, in things that are going on around the world. I am amazed that, that the uh, British are protesting. Uh, some of the things which have happened here in the United States when they have such a very poor record on human rights throughout history. To me, it's a little hypocritical. Uh, in fact, it's a whole lot hypocritical. But we really want to stick tonight and take a look at what scriptures talks about. And I might say to you, let's go to Revelation chapter 8. And like I said, we're going to cover and kind of recover some of the things that we've, that we've uh, covered before. Remember all of this, this is actually looking back to a time and a place where the apostles are sitting with Christ on the Mount of Olives. And they're asking him, what's the sign of your coming? Not signs, sign. And he's saying, he's going to give them an answer. It's long, covers two chapters, 24 and 25 in the book of Matthew. It covers the book of Luke. It is something which is so vital, so important. And it's what the book of, of uh, <clears throat> uh, Revelation is written about. I may also say to you that Mr. Kaufman, Brother Kaufman is going to be doing Jeremiah for Sunday school. And it is, he mentioned to me today that as you come into the chapter beyond what he did today for Jeremiah, those chapters beyond that, look at the end times. 
Yeah, it's, it's negative, yes, it's not pleasant. Uh, there is a lot of death, there is a great deal of persecution which takes place. But let me always remind you that all of this has to precede the second coming of Christ. So it's not a matter of trying to get the, uh, uh, despondent about these things, it's a matter of looking and saying there are things that must take place before Christ returns. And there's a blessing for doing that. There's a blessing for understanding what's about to happen. There's a blessing for being able to say, I can, I can know and prepare for what's about to, to take place. I do understand a lot of people would say there's no way of preparing uh, in a total manner for what's about to happen. And I would certainly agree with that. But nonetheless, I can prepare for part of it. And I can have an opportunity in a time to uh, Look and say, <clears throat> um, I know that he's coming. Some of you are going to tell me, I know that, he's, that, that the promise in Scripture is not that he's just going to return, but that he's going to come like a thief in the night. You know, that's given in Thessalonians. It's given in four verses that are written there. It tells you he's going to come like a thief in the night. Right in the middle of it, though, it says to us as Christian people, it should not overtake you, brother, as a thief in the night. Should not then why do we expect it should overtake us as a thief when the Apostle Paul writes and says it shouldn't overtake us? And it shouldn't because he gives us the details. And part of those details are what we're looking at tonight. But also all of the prophecies about the nation of Israel back and throughout the Old Testament are there. And you know what? We need to look at it and say, it's there for our purpose. It's there for be a blessing to us and it is not a game. This is not a game. Too many people have played this as a game, as a way of making money, as a way of taking money from people and using that money for their own purposes. Sell books, sell material. Yep, there's some great guys out there. I do not want to label everybody with the same brush because that would not be true. But there are many out there who have used this as um, as a green prophecy. Green in a sense, it's just to raise money. And that's dead wrong. But there is a blessing out there for prophecy. There is a blessing out there for understanding it, being able to pull it together. Sure, doesn't always sound very good, but it's also very true. You know, let me, uh, let me do something a little bit different. We're gonna run through some of these early slides here very, very quickly. And then we'll skip over and uh, uh, get down to, down to the nitty gritty here. <clears throat> What's the sign of your coming? In Revelation chapter 8, 1 says, When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And remember, he's got a scroll in his hands. And Jesus is literally ripping these scrolls open one at a time. It comes to the seventh scroll, and instead of it being something that we would look at and say there's certain things that pertain to the seventh scroll, it actually opens up seven trumpets. It's as if those seven trumpets are inside the seven seals. They're, they're, they're a part of that seventh seal, I should say. So he's, he's going to open up the seventh seal, but at the same time, he's going to open up those eight, those seven trumpets that are out there. He does that a couple of times. And it's also, I want you to understand, one of the big things here is, regardless of you know, how you look at things, Revelation does not run in a chronological fashion. You know, he's had, he's had a couple of uh, chapter seven. He's looked at his, uh, a chapter there, his does not talk about the seals. It talks about some things that we see happening in heaven and on earth, but more, more than anything else on heaven. Now it returns back to the seals, back to the seventh seal. In fact, he says there's a silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And then he says, bingo, the angel, but God gave the uh, angel, seven angels seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood on the altar having a golden censer. And it was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Yeah. You know, if that doesn't fit with your vision of the prayers of saints, maybe you need to redo your vision. 
because this is the second time in the book of Revelation this is, that this is put this way. I read a, a prayer that I liked that was offered by a man when he's saying, asking God to, to, uh, to, to, re, to bring judgment upon our enemies, bring judgment upon them. David does that pretty frequently. It's called imprecatory psalms. And it's the same way here. This is an imprecatory prayer asking God to judge our enemies. But pastor, that's not the love of God. Yes, it is. It is the love of God. It's the love of God towards his, his own. It's the love of God which is actually looking at men and saying to them, change, change, change. And sometimes just like it is with our kids, we have to use discipline to bring about a change in our children. Actually, if we don't discipline them, even if it may hurt for a while, or if it may cause tears and so forth for a while, if we don't discipline them, we don't love them. That's the reality. God loves us. He's offered us Christ on the cross. He's offered us Christ in, in a, a terrible period of his life where he serves us. He does all the things that, that uh, are necessary to give us salvation. He dies for us. He's resurrected for us. Takes us into heaven. He's had other men who's brought who have brought the gospel uh, to us, and now he's saying, "I'm about to judge the world." But I think, frankly, when you begin to look at it, you'll also recognize and realize he has sent men throughout history to tell us what's going to happen. He's warned us and warned us and warned us. Love does not always motivate men to do what they should do. Sometimes it's discipline, and the same thing is true here. It's nice to preach the love of God, but at some point, we have to look and say, if you don't, this is the response. And this is the response that God has for the world. We have here a slide, and I want to you know, make a couple of points very quickly here. This is that seven year period. The seven year period, uh, again, um, Mr. Coffin did this this past week for, or this is doing this this coming Sunday rather, for the seventh, 70 years of Daniel's uh, prophecies that are given. The last seven years of that 70 years is a year or a seven year span is left out by itself for the latter times. And this is that seventh year. Now it says seven weeks, but it's actually seven years that it spans it out here. And it's given, as we have shown here, a three and a half year span first, and then another three and a half year spans ending here with the return of Christ. Actually, that comes back in here also, the rapture, which we look forward to, occurs at the same time. It is as if Christ is coming down and we're going up to meet him. You know, sometimes when you hear things that are said, books that are read, movies that have been made, you need to make really sure those are correct and accurate. And what you really see is time and again, and there is no secret rapture out there, but time and again, what we see is, is that our going up to be raptured with him and his coming down to us is the same. Now, there's a time frame when we spend some time in heaven with him, and I can't tell you what that is. And I can't tell you when the rapture is going to occur. That no man knows. But if you'll notice, and I've marked it here. Now, I know here we have the arrival of the two witnesses. I want to tell you that this, I think this slide is wrong. I think that what we have is those two witnesses appear here in the first three and a half years of that seven-year period. And I'll tell you why I think that's true. Number one is this second three and a half years is split. And on that, th that second three and a half years, it's also a time of great destruction throughout this world. Great destruction. destruction. Part of that is the fact that the Lord's wrath starts in here. We have things going on and happening that would not permit uh, telecommunications and so forth to, to be usable. It's a time when the earth is literally coming apart. You know, I was reading the other day, it was talking about the magnetic pole of, or the pole, north pole of the earth is moving. 
And it began back about 150 years ago and began to shift to the east. Well, it's began very slowly, and now it's, it's, the speed of that movement is beginning, is becoming very, very quickly. We're not sure what would happen, and I'm going to say this is exactly what's going to happen. I always hate to, to kind of base prophecy on certain events, but what I do look and say is, is the, the, uh, the question is, if this is true and we suddenly get the North, North and South Pole switch, what's going to be the effect on the Earth? I'll tell you what, I don't want to be flying over the Atlantic during this time. This is not necessarily the Earth itself flipping over, this is that the poles switch. GPS and many different things would be totally messed up. But the big thing about that is that we're not totally sure what the effects would be. It had a devastating effect on people trying to communicate and on things trying to happen. We're already seeing some effects from it now. And actually that movement is speeding up. Now I'm going to lose some of you because you're going to say, I don't want to hear it. You know, I don't have enough Xanax for tonight. That's not the idea. The idea is to say, here's the warning. Here it is. But I think that first three and a half years is when those two witnesses come. And that's Elijah and Enoch. And I want to tell you, the early church said that repeatedly. In the very, very earliest church, before the year 150, was saying it's Elijah and Enoch. And those men who lived near that time said that's what the Apostle John told them. That's what the Apostle John told them. There's a section down here where it says that uh, part of the prophecy is given to John. It says, you know, the angel tells John, seal it up, don't write it. What it doesn't say is you can't talk about it. And there are writings that are there, and there are things that, are, that have been said by Arrhenius and by different church, early church fathers. It's that John said, those two witnesses are Elijah and Enoch, and that they came during this first half. But most don't want to put it out here on the end, but you know what? Most of those who stick it out there on the end are also pre-tribulationists. And for some reason, they think all of this is the wrath of God, and it's not the wrath of God. Some of this is not the wrath of God. I think it's the wrath of Satan. And that wrath of Satan is directed at you and I as Christian people. If you're listening tonight and you're not a Christian, you need to let one of us help you to deal with it. Or you need to ask and pray that God would give you eternal life and forgive you of your sin. You need to make sure that you believe in Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the, from the, uh, from the dead. But if you're sure that you're a Christian, then make sure that you'll also know you won't be here for that last part. Somebody's going to say, well, you know, we're kept safe from the wrath. I agree fully. It's when the wrath starts is the problem. It's when the wrath starts. If you go back to Revelation chapter 6, the very end of it, it says, now is the wrath of the Lamb come. It's given repeatedly. It's also given in Matthew chapter 24. It's given in Joel chapter 2. It's given in, in uh, Luke chapter 21. It's given in Micah. It's given in Zechariah. It's given repeatedly. It's given in Jeremiah. It's given in Deuteronomy. It's given repeatedly. That the wrath of God, how it will begin and what it will be like, and the sun will darken, and the moon will be dark, and the stars will fall. And the earth will be shaken out of its, its uh, foundations. I don't know. Maybe that's what we're looking at as far as the switching of the poles. But whatever it may be, it's something that's way past a tsunami or an earthquake or anything like that. You know, the United States has two super volcanoes that we know of that are beneath us. One in Yellowstone, one on the west coast. We have one that which is found underneath the, the Pacific Ocean. These are things that if, if, if the one in Yellowstone were to go off, be devastating to over half of the American country. Make it unusable. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, it's something that can be so devastating and you won't have time to go out and buy toilet paper like you have for this in pandemic. 
and it's sure not going to help you any anyway. I'm not trying to be light here. Do understand this is deadly serious. <clears throat> but it's something that you need to stop and think about. But when the trumpets start, if you look very carefully here, here's the resurrection and the rapture that takes place in Jesus Christ revelation. Because what it says is Christ is going to reveal himself in, in, in the air. <clears throat> He's going to be seen as returning. And at the same time, we're going to be going up to meet him in the air. Then the trumpets begin to blow one after another. There's a time here that's called the Antichrist Great Tribulation. This is Satan. This is Satan who's going to be able to bring great tribulation against the saints and against the Jews. Please don't let somebody tell you that you won't be here for this. Please somebody just tell you that you'll never see the third temple built in Jerusalem. All those things are things that you can look at and say, it is true. There's nothing secret about the rapture. It's not a dog whistle rapture, as has been said by some. A dog whistle rapture, that's, that's a whistle that you blow and you can't hear it as the dog's owner. The neighbors can't hear it, just the dog hears it. It's not a dog whistle rapture. When he takes up us up off the ground, he's on his way down and you'll be able to see both. And it will be devastating to this world around us. Devastating and frightening. But nonetheless, those seven trumpets will begin to blow. I will also tell you, if you look, this is the end of the seventh, uh, end of the uh, seven year period here. And it's the salvation of Israel. It's the seven year period is complete and the mystery of God is completed. Then there's seven bowls of wrath, final wrath, and then the restoration of the kingdom. You know where that's at? That's 75 years that are given in the book of Daniel. 75 years are given in the book of Daniel. And it's not given anywhere else. There's no big explanation given for it. What's always been kind of fascinating is, is there's a feast of dedication. It's listed in the New Testament. Christ uses it as a biblical example. So I would have to say that he, he assumes it to be true. And it happens to fit into some things which are given in scripture and given very completely. Excuse me. But it also means to us that that 75 years is a part of the last, uh, part of the end of this age. I don't like to use the end of the world because this is the end of the age. This is the beginning of a new relationship that God is going to put with his people. He's going to start doing something in a little different way. I hope that kind of clears things up a little bit because um, you know, I've had a couple of people ask me questions and I certainly want to be just as, as clear as I can possibly be. That first trumpet, the first angel sounded and there fell, there uh, followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. In other words, the whole plant, the, there's a third of the planet now looks like El Paso. It's a time and you know, place that we really find it difficult. It's silence, the golden censers there, the prayer of the saints, the fire from the altar, voices and thunderings and lamp, lightnings and earthquake. And we don't have time tonight to cover some of the symbolisms that are here. These are tremendous symbolis symbolisms that are given from the tabernacle and the temple. If you don't, under, don't understand them and don't know them, you do well to take them, look them up. It's easy enough to do today. It's kind of like going back over the, the timing here. You have the first three and a half years, the first three seals. Then you have the midpoint that's given. You have the abomination of desolation. That's the Antichrist. I don't know whether it's David Rockefeller or George Soros. I don't know who it is. Frankly, I think it's going to be a Jew. That would make Soros able. Source is too old. It's not him. But then all of a sudden he comes down and he, he goes into that third temple in Jerusalem and he sits in the Holy of Holies. He desecrates it. Christ is angry. He desecrates his temple. Then the next these three seals uh, happen and say Satan's wrath 
comes down upon the church and upon the Jews. And let me just say to you as believers, you know, there's been a big debate, but this says we will fight the Antichrist and he will bring us under submission. But it says we will fight him. We do have a right to fight at this point. But he's going to bring us under submission. Pastor, why in the world would God do that? It's like he's always done. He usually puts his people in a place where they are almost defeated, almost extinguished. And then at that point, then he steps in and does what we cannot do. He wants to make very sure that when you're all done, all said and done, you know it was his glory. It was he that did this. Not you, not your might, not your strength, not your weapons, not your A-10 warthog or whatever it may be. It's he has done this. He has rescued you. It's his power, his love. Everything is, revolves around him, revolves around him. Understand that. And it'll, it'll help you to understand a lot of things that go on. <clears throat> when the seventh, seventh seal happens, is the second coming and the rapture that occurs. You can see those, and I know this is quick. You know, if some of you wanted to, if, if you are a church member here, if you'll ask, I'll give you copies. If you're not a church member and you want some copies made of some of these things, please call, give us your address or how we might reach you, and uh, we'll be glad to, uh, to send you some material. Seventh Trumpets. In the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, that's what it's called in scripture. It's not called a tribulation period. It's called a Jacob's trouble. The 70th week of Daniel, whatever it may be. It's the first trumpet, and you get a fire and hail. Um, we, I'm not gonna repeat that one again. And two of the plagues that were used against e Egypt are mixed with blood here. And then it's, is it symbolic or is it real? I personally think it's real. It's not symbolic at all. How are we doing? 28. So it's <clears throat> second trumpet comes along and the second angel sounded and as it were a great mountain cast burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood and the third part of the cre creatures which were in the sea and had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Is it a volcano? Is it a meteor? Whatever it may be. I will tell you this, I'm sorry. I'll tell you this, that whatever that may be, there is a comet or a meteor which is on its way to Earth, which it is said that it may uh, hit Earth in the year 2027. I thought that's kind of fascinating, the timing and the date that's here. But regardless of what it may be, it is true that there's a comet or a meteor that's on its way to here. And, um, if that were to happen, it would be devastating. The third trumpet falls, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. You need to watch the wording. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became a, uh, Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Wormwood is actually a poison. It is. Now, whether well, that's again, whether it's a meter, a meteor, or whatever it may be, it affects the inland waters, the waters we use for drinking. Wormwood is a, is a poison or a medicine in some cases. It's the fresh water is devastated. It's, or the fresh water is, is ruined. It's devastating. I will tell you that the Russian word for warmer, warm wood is Chernobyl, which would make it seem like it would be linked to something nuclear. I don't know that that's a necessarily a, uh, a coincidence. You know, taken out of the Quran, it's called the chapter of the star. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. The likeness of his light is as a mishkat or a niche in which is in a lamp. The lamp is in a glass and the glass is as, uh, <clears throat> is as it were a brightly shining star. Compare this with Revelation and we see the great similarities. I think personally the, the uh, Muslims have taken this from, uh, from, our, from us. The memorial at Chernobyl to what it took place there at Chernobyl is an angel blowing a trumpet. How fitting. And I don't think it's a coincidence. I think there's enough Russians 
and so forth in that area that they would have known exactly this prophecy because there are a tremendous number of, of Christians which uh, live in that area. I taught there for a period of time in a uh, seminary which is there, had that privilege and met uh, many of them and I found it to be fascinating how, uh, how much they do know. The fourth trumpet, and we have the angel, third part of the sun was smitten, third part of the moon. By the way, you're going to find this is a, a repet, repetitive thing, which is, uh, Ray, I'm getting an echo. Uh, it's a repetitive thing, which we hear constantly <clears throat> in Scripture about the sun being darkened, the moon being darkened. Uh, the day does not shine, it does not shine for a third part of it in the night likewise. Sometimes, in, in a, and it's, it's on the internet, there's given a kind of an Egyptian view of what it was like during that darkness which occurred in Egypt during the plagues that were given. And, and it, it really says, you know, to a, a great degree that it's like being in Carlsbad Caverns when they turned the lights off there. It's just totally dark, you can't see anything. And they mention in those things that, that the Egyptians wrote, not the Jews, but the Egyptians wrote, they mentioned the fact that, that it was terribly uh, frightening. I know that up in um, Carlsbad, when you turn the lights off, it doesn't take very long before you want them turned back on. And this is called a woe judgment. It's a very special one. It's a terrible judgment because of what it does to us. <clears throat> and I'm covering it very fast because we've already done it. Is this, again, perhaps is this something that it's, it has to do with the, with the poles being uh, reversed? However it occurs, this is the earth changing position. However it's possible or however it happens, it's something which occurs that causes the earth to lose its, uh, its uh, ability to stay solid. I don't know how dark it is exactly and what part of the earth is affected, but there's a great deal of it. You know, it's the same thing as the darkness that, that covered the earth after Jesus died. And please understand that darkness is recorded around the world. South American Indians have it. The North American Indians have it. Chinese have it. The African continent, it's listed. It's listed in Europe. And in fact, it's written in history that one of the Caesars sent, uh, sent out a man to check it out and find out why this occurred. Who is this man? And I say that because you need to understand this is not an eclipse. This was something much more severe than an eclipse which does not darken down everything completely. <clears throat> I think the grass and the, uh, the trumpets, I mean, it's, I've heard it said these are Christians as shown as the grass trees or leadership and so forth. I, mean, I think literally these, these are strictly grass and trees. And I know we've listed some dates here, but and actually it's meant to be a little bit, I guess perhaps a little bit sarcastic because these are three dates that were given that the rapture was supposed to have occurred on and it didn't occur. 1844 is probably the best one that's known. And people actually went up on Mars and practiced the rapture. Unfortunately, gravity overcame those and they found this just to be devastating to your legs. And again, a lot of this has been used to make money. I'm not asking for your money. I do not sell prayer cloths. I do not sell holy water or any of those things. Everything that I have is for free. It's been given to me free. It's offered to you free. But the main thing is don't be trapped look at scripture and say, see what scripture says, not what a man has said, or not what he's necessarily pulled off of things which are occurring here. So it's a woe is me, the fifth trump hits. It's against the people of the earth. It's a star from heaven. It's with a very loud voice. In other words, it's not something you can miss. It's demonic locusts which are there to torture man for five months. It doesn't kill, they torture. Sometimes death is preferable to what can occur to people. And this is a terrifying description that's given to these beings. And we find the, the smoke to rise up out of the shaft in darkness. And this is it uh, taken from uh, 
place in the Euphrates. Remember that everything in Scripture that revolves around here about the second coming and about the rapture, it occurs and takes place around the city of Jerusalem. That is God's home. It's not New York. It's not Moscow. It's not Salt Lake City. It's not Seoul, Korea. It's none of those areas. It happens around the nation of Israel and around the city of Jerusalem. The fifth trumpet again is a woe trumpet. It's a torture of mankind. It's, uh, they are given power. They have no power of their own. They are given power. And it's given to them by God. And they only hurt those who are without the seal. There's uh, no vegetation is hurt. Their description is given. Their horses with crowns, men's faces, women's hair, and teeth like lions. Their breastplates of iron and wings that sound like chariots with many horses running to battle. Sometimes sit down and try and draw that out. It has to be a, a being which is not only unique, but terrifying, to say the least. They have tails like scorpions with stings that last for five months. And their king is Apollyon, the destroyer, which is another name for Satan. First Enoch chapter 10 is kind of an interesting, and Enoch is not a book that most of you would know, but Enoch is a book which is written theoretically by the prophet Enoch. Much of it has been destroyed. There's the early parts of it seem to be fairly accurate. As it goes on down the road, it's certainly corrupt. It has been used in the past by Christian fathers to get some of the history that uh, was that was wanted there. But you, again, you said, you know, again, it says that again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind his ale, hand and foot, and cast him into darkness, uh, make an opening in the de desert. And what it's actually dealing with here is the burial of some angels that were fallen angels who had corrupted themselves <coughs> with men, uh, with women. Um, <coughs> so they are the ones who we see in Genesis who have corrected themselves by cohabiting with the women of the earth. And it is ones that uh, uh, are given to have a great deal of danger. The same thing's true in, in Enoch, uh, First Enoch chapter 18. And they have made us a deep abyss with columns. And, uh, and they are buried and put there. It's a place, it's waste. It's a horrible place. And it is like uh, nothing that we could possibly know. But it is something which is underneath the ground. I know some people don't like using some of these areas. But I think sometimes that, uh, we miss some things that are written. And by the way, Enoch is, is quoted in the book of Job. He is quoted in the book of Job in Scripture. Jude, I'm sorry. In the book of Jude, uh, he is quoted uh, about the second coming. The sixth trumpet, four angels of the Euphrates River. Is that what Enoch is describing? It's very possible. Are loosed by command of voice from the four, four horns of the golden altar. Four angels are bound in the Euphrates. They are loosed for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. That's a long time when they're tormenting you. They're there to slay a third part of men with an army of, and again, that's demonic beings or humans. It's often used as, uh, the number which is given here is used to symbolize uh, huge numbers. If you look very carefully, I think we'd say that this is a, a an army of men and not necessarily is that true because the way that's written there is not necessarily an army of men are these the angels of turkey and syria and iraq and iran because they they play a very primary uh, part in the end time here and we see them already coming back to life and taking their their uh, their leadership roles that they will have later and it's interesting if you take a look, we have the colors that are given and the description that's given here. And it's the red is fire, sulfur for yellow, and hyacinth for blue, and the lion is symbol of Iran or Persia. Iran is Persia. And here we see a picture taken out of a movie made in Muslim countries. And of course you see those colors which are so predominant. We see it here again in modern day times, uh, given in uh, than Turkey during election time. Is Turkey the, the uh, wooden horse and is the uh, trap that uh, traps uh, NATO? 
and she is now a member of NATO, and she actually has next to ours the largest army in NATO. It's very powerful. Seventh angel. His appearance, he's clothed with a cloud, a rainbow. He has a face like the sun. His feet is the pillars of fire. He has an open book in his hand. He has a foot on land, a foot on sea. Let me say to you, a lot of people would say it's Christ. Others would say it's an angel. I think it's one that we could fight all day over, but I think in essence, uh, I think it boils down to this is a special angel who has a special place. He roars like a lion which would make him the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which is one of the titles that Christ holds. But again, he has, he's clothed with a cloud, a rainbow, the sign that was given to Noah, face like the sun, brilliant, feet as pillars of fire, judgment, and an open book in hand, the book of life, and a foot on land, a foot on sea, he controls everything, and he roars like a lion. He cried with a loud voice, again, like a lion. He's got seven thunders. He says, seal up that with this big honor. And it fascinates me here that he says, this is the mystery of God is finished. In other words, all the things he's, he's talked about and that he's planned for during throughout the years, he says, now they're finished. And in fact, it says a little bit later, because remember, the book of Revelation will give, give you some description, then continue down and come back give you more description of the same events and then go on down, come back and give you more description. I think what he's saying here, the mystery of God is finished. Everything's over. Now the wrath of God's not finished yet because he's going to cleanse it and prepare it for his, his coming to earth and for his people to return. Remember, the earth is ours. These Christian people, it's ours. This is not a, a, a thing of ecology. This is our planet. The meek shall inherit the earth. And it's set forth for that. The little book could be scripture. It's, uh, was, it's sweet to the mouth, but bitter to the stomach. And then he tells John, and I think this really involves his writing of scripture and the things that are there. You're back to work, John. You're not done. You're not done at all. I appreciate your time this evening, and I hope that you will <clears throat> will take the time to do more study. We will be looking at some of these events in greater detail as we uh, go on forward in the in the very near future. And we appreciate you having us with us this evening. For those of you who have been here for the last one, you're going to say some of these is, some of this is repetitive. I think it needs to be because I've, I've had a ton of questions which would indicate to me that I think we need to go back over some of it and make sure that people have a good solid grasp of it before we go forward. Thank you.